We take technology completely for granted. When will the next iPhone come out? We take it for granted that there is such a thing as a next iPhone with, full of innovations. The next bus going from my village into the middle of Oxford. I take it for granted that there will be this vehicle that will carry me. I stumble down in the morning and have coffee from a coffee machine. And this is really weird because if we step back a little, we are a single species of around maybe three million that other species that are alive today and at least five billion that has ever lived. A single species and there's no other species that has you know, an electric garlic press. Really weird. So why is this? second segment of this crazy 24-hour lecture on the state of the species. First we had a discussion about the interaction between economics and biology and then I talked a little bit about how it might have been a change in the climate 2.6 million years ago that could have triggered our ancestors to figure out fire and once fire was there, fire was in our control, cooking might have appeared. And we have all kinds of consequences in our body from that moment in evolution. Because we have these large brains, which we couldn't possibly maintain unless we ate cooked food. We have these small, nimble joes that were, would be useless if we were not eating cooked food. We have ribcage, which is not protruding, like for the chimpanzees and bonobos, because we need less intestines, because we eat cooked food. But there's something else, because there's something not in our body, but in our behavior that might be coming from the process of cooking. Because when you cook, you need to be able to wait. It's a technology that you need to invest in. You need to not just gobble down the food right away. Yeah? So maybe that was a point where our species evolved patience. Patience that is required in all these technologies around us. And after that, all we needed to do is to accumulate it through many, many generations. So that we can end up with the electric garlic press. <laughs> In the Netherlands, we have this uh, funny or uh, strange habit of congratulating the whole family when someone uh, yeah. has a birthday. I think that that sounds valid. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, obviously they haven't actually killed the person, since, you know, up till that point. So, uh, you know, living with people's not always the easiest. Oh, exactly. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure you're the Yeah, no murder stuff. this year. We're good. <laughs> in, in a little bit later, I will I will bring in Darwin, uh, Athena, and and there's this wonderful passage. I will read this wonderful passage. Oh, well, wonderful. This passage when he passes uh, by Tierra, Tierra del Fuego and, and, and where you know, they, they eat each other when it's really, really tough, tough times. So Darwin has this incredible description of cannibalism. Anyway, so we return, and we return to cannibalism um, at the end, a food sharing episode when you, when you actually eat the community. So. <laughs> Later, let, let's see how far we get with this killing, <laughs> slaughtering of the. Of, of the Sounds birthday. like we're getting into the zombie apocalypse, Tomas. So. Mm. Mm. <laughs> no, no. Mm. So, guys, what do you think about this this question of this this space to move between economics and and biology? This this shared element of of, of foresight. I actually have have something to say about that actually. I think it's necessary for our future decision making to really consider all of this in the context of complexity. And it totally makes sense. At the moment I'm focused on mental health and um, our future in terms of our well-being. And that is really, really closely linked with how we structure our success and economy and what measures we look at. So I think it's really important to keep everything 
linked together. So that's very like interesting. Context You're, matters. I, context really, really matters. I, so, I agree with that. And, and I've been thinking a lot about it in the current situation. You know, we hear a lot of rhetoric, I hear a lot of rhetoric, especially from young people whose conclusion is that capitalism is the problem. It's broken. And as I dig deeper, I realize they're actually conflating two somewhat orthogonal things. The purely economic structure, you know, our means of productions are owned privately or they're owned by the state, and a social structure which is highly individualistic. Uh, there's a famous book from the 60s, late 60s, called I'm Okay, You're Okay. The 2020 version is written by perhaps the far right. It's called I'm Okay, Fuck You. <laughs> um, and, and then the other side of that, that dimension is collective responsibility. And so this is very much a biological or a social structure. Uh, I've been doing a lot of work in New Zealand, and what's interesting there is it's highly capitalist, but it's also got a very strong sense of collective responsibility. Here, in certain parts of the U.S., they're saying, no, it's my right to not wear a mask. Why should you tell me what to do? And there's this sort of anti-collective responsibility. That is a separate dimension from, from the underlying mathematics of the economic structure, but they get highly tangled. I think that may be what you're saying about the complexity. And we, for some reason, we don't disentangle them to analyze them. And we therefore create this highly polarized view that at least in the current dialogue in the, in the US is so difficult to resolve and creates conflict. I have an answer to your question box. too. Um, so if I think about, so what's the relationship between economics and and biological anthropology, it reminds me, so I'm, I'm a, a four field trained anthropologist. So in our fields, we have archeology, span biological anthropology, linguistic anthropology and cultural anthropology. And at some point I just realized that we're all interested in very different spans of time. And the biological anthropologists are interested in the longest spans of time and the eco economists are interested clearly based on what you said in some very short spans of time. And the linguistic anthropologists I know are interested in even shorter spans of time because they'll study these transcripts of conversations and they're like looking at things at minutes. And so the archeologists are somewhere in the middle. So I'm sure at some point you'll get to prehistory and history. And so you see this interest in smaller and smaller spans of time. I like that you brought up murder right away because I think it sort of shatters a misconception in my innocent California upbringing that I truly believed in the goodness of people. And at some point I had to <laughs> come face to face with the fact that we're actually a very violent species and it's not the exception, but an inherent part of our capacity to hurt one another. And so I've kind of dropped that perception because otherwise people just constantly disappoint you if you expect so much from them. And, uh, and so I like that you bring that up right away because if you think about the crisis that we're facing, it's basically some of us or all of us murdering each other at different rates of speed, right? <laughs> it's not the same as bashing each other on the head with a with a rock in order to get the, the great fruit tree behind you, but it's not that different really, so. I have a slightly more optimistic view. <laughs> <laughs> so. Pretty dark. Yeah. Um, so I'm kind of coming at this from uh, evolutionary biology, psychology, anthropology. We have a, a project called the Human Generosity Project where we look across cultures at cooperation and we also do computer modeling and experiments with human subjects. And so for me, the thing that pops out to us when thinking about sort of, you know, foresight and economics and um, evolutionary biology is that, you know, I think that we're really accustomed to markets as the main way that resources are transferred. Um, but if we look at how small scale societies work, when it comes to managing risk, um, so, you know, things can happen that are unexpected. Um, and if you look at how small scale societies deal with those, you know, unexpected, unpredictable things, people help each other based on seeing the need and having the ability to help. 
So it's almost like there's a sort of informal insurance system that is just based on the relationships that people have in these small scale societies. And this allows them to, you know, deal with a lot of um, ecological volatility that no individual would be able to deal with, or even, you know, small group would be able to deal with. Um, and, and I think that, you know, when we start thinking about our modern society, um, the way that, you know, we manage risk is still through markets, right? Like we have insurance markets where you pay in order to have the chance of getting, you know, bailed out if something bad happens to you. But a lot of people, you know, can't afford to keep paying in and then they have no protection. Or, you know, if you even take like some of the most extreme events that could happen, um, they're, they're so unlikely um, or they're so not so much unlikely, but it's hard to even say what the likelihood is and what the magnitude would be. So you can't put together, you know, uh, actuarial table to figure out what um, kind of premium you would have to pay for it. So I think there's some, you know, real failures in terms of like how do you manage risk um, of extreme events with uh, the sort of, you know, standard market exchange. And um, I think that if we look to you know, small scale societies that how they do it, there might be some hints for us that we could use to actually have better foresight um, when it comes to avoiding, um, you know, catastrophes that could have lots of reverberating consequences for us as humanity. It is so interesting to look at, look at your discovery of, of the demand based versus the need based versus accounting based uh, resource, resource flow, uh, because because it sort of goes back to this age old discussion between Darwin and Marx. Have you ever had this conversation how Darwin and Marx were contemporaries? And then, and then uh, Duke and Weber and, and uh, Westermark were also contemporaries in the grandchildren generation from Darwin and Marx. Mm -hmm. And sort of, I, I, the, you know, when, in, when I think about your need based uh, idea, which I think is one of the most exciting ideas right now out there. Uh, you know, uh, just to, to everyone else, uh, my dream is that Athena and I will actually uh, employ her her uh, need based uh, versus accounting based system to to what what will come much later about about uh, my bit of of network science. Uh, anyway, so so if we look at the origin, uh, the the idea origin of that, you know, that you basically you ended up in the need based uh, um, uh, resource provisioning idea but from a Darwin, Westermark, Hamilton, and so on route, but goes back explaining what Marx was actually talking about. It's really cool. So actually, Athena, I don't know whether this is gonna to be too much of a stretch, but maybe you allow me. Athena discovered how, discovered communism on a cell level. <laughs> you could say that. Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Our bodies, at least, uh, they, you know, a, a bunch of our signaling systems are there for getting resources to where they need to go in the body. Communism cell level up for 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 so many different things, including okay. So, okay, all right. Uh, shall we move on to the next? Um, oh, yeah. So, Tomash, I think I think Cecile uh, was raising her hand. Bonobos and the chimps have that obviously are extremely aware of what uh, a resource, the resources are there, not only, and not only just the ones that they need to get and the one that ones that are around them, but also the ones that are in them. One thing that the COVID has revealed anew is how what we call resources can be completely appended when suddenly the need for nurses and people carers has become such a frontline resource, whereas gold is not really that much top of our list right now. Because we always forget about gold. Gold is basically a shiny piece of metal, yeah? So like when, you know, well, the most pre uh, co consistently value stuff that we assign value to is a shiny piece of something. I mean, <laughs> like, yeah, <laughs> like what well, we want is shiny things. And of course, it is the social world that we really have uh, around us, uh, really. Rick. Thomas, maybe this is a good uh, 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 thought provoker as you transition to the next session. The 
time of economic advantage has changed dramatically over this, you know, tens of thousands of years as well, right? As societies have changed. And the time it takes to show economic advantage and the time it takes for collectivization to manifest itself, markets and insurance starting in coffee houses in the, in the 15th and 16th century in London, because that's where people came together to share information and insuring against big risks, which would be the calamity of a big ship going down with all that gold. That changes too. So, um, you know, there's an axis of time that's not uh, always consistent in human evolution and in development. And that I think may be an interesting transition as you get into the next session. This is, so yeah, thank you for the great segue and yeah, we should get into the next session. Just, just a reflection on this. So this February, um, I, I was actually talking to, I was brought back to my old profession because a bunch of uh, bank regulators asked me to give a keynote for a, a, a global central banker, bank regulator. Uh, uh, so I'd go, gone back and talked about regulating banks and re regulating the financial market with my new brain and new, well, uh, new insights. And I realized exactly what you said, is that there is a time element, but it's a social time element. So is it, uh, hmm, oh. you know what, I will come back to this later uh, because I, I want to tell, tell how, Homo, homo uh, sapiens argentariensis, yeah? So the banker human. So there the used to be somebody who you trust. Somebody who is the, the ultimate person who, who will never cheat you. And that shifted into a person who will, who, who will try to trick you out of this money, out of the money. And I think that shift had a lot to do with the restructuring of our societies and with, in which it is impossible to keep, impossible or we don't do it, to, to create the kind of long lasting bond with a banker that would create that trust. And, and that, that has, I think, a, a lot to do how our society level time sped up compared to our personal time. Um, but I will come back to this much, much, much later if I like. All right, okay, let's try this trick of, of sharing the screen again. Okay, can you see these three guys from New Guinea? Great. Okay, so, so my next bit happened um, in, um, so when I was sort of leaving the industry, uh, I was brought back into, I brought into a, a midway point and I worked uh, with the World Bank um, on the New Guinea Highlands, which had been actually my dream for a long time because uh, when I was uh, early 90s, early 20s, there was a, on the Hungarian TV, I'm from Hungary, uh, um, on the Hungarian TV, there was a four part series with, with, with Wolf Schiffenhofer, who is the, one of the funders of human ethology about his work on New Guinea Highlands. And much later I met, met him and I realized that Wolf likes to tell st stories, uh, but I was desperate to go to, to the New Guinea Highlands. And there were a bunch of things I, 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 I learned there. I had gone there with the idea that we, we can be different from each other in human subpopulations. And then I walked away with the idea that we really are the same, that that we have some fundamental inherited behavior that is identical across humans. And, and this was a very strong feeling um, after, so my job was there to, to, to sort of think about how not to screw up the last place on the planet that hadn't been screwed up yet. So I don't know whether you know New Guinea, it's a very long island. And we were looking at Irian Jaya, which is the Western part, which belongs to Indonesia. And this was 87% forest cover. It's very high mountains, um, long. So four, the mountain ridge is four, 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 four and a half thousand meters high up and 900 kilometers long and about 150, 200 kilometers wide. And it's a bit like this. So it's full of different cultures because the, the every valley here 
is going to be a different culture because you can't maintain a military supply line across the across the ridge. So 200, just that bit of the of 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 the island, so the western bit, uh, 252 separate languages in 60 language families. So extreme variation. But I I learned how how very very similar they are to each other, and I was to them. It's a really interesting revelation that, that gave a boost to, to, to my work later. But anyway, the point I wanted to make here is that when you go out on the forest and you see a bunch of uh, uh, guys like these guys and you look at their arrows, you can tell what they're hunting for. So if, you, if you're going to have a, a, a long arrow with, with a very pointy end, and often black because it's, it was reinforced in the fire, then it is, they were, they were going for, for birds or for chicken grooves. If, if it has obviously three pointy ends and they go for fish, um, if, they, if it's sort of a, a knife-like thing like this, uh, made of bamboo, the end, they, they're going for, for pig. And if they're, they have the kind of bobs that the guy in the middle has, that's for people. Sophistication, yes. Yeah? So they are going to have several different kinds of arrows. The arrows vary themselves. And the point I want to make here is that when you go there a few years later, you will see none of this because they are made of wood and intestines. So they rot. So one of the things that keeps bothering me when we look at, try to tell the story of human prehistory and especially how our species evolved and how our species appeared, is that we really use the archeologist understandable focus on whatever they found, but then we, we sort of limit ourselves very much. And this is a very understandable thing because archeology span used to be an art discipline. As archeology span moved from an art discipline towards science, there is a physics envy, which I know very well from economics, and hence holds the imagination back and holds the discussion back. So I witnessed in several different archaeology conferences when people didn't dare to say what they actually thought. Uh, oh yeah, by the way, I, I want to say at the beginning, so, so this is not, what I'm doing now is obviously not a scientific lecture, so in the sense that I will just say whatever I want. So uh, I'm, I'm not, yeah, uh, yeah. I say whatever I think is the most likely in my head. Anyway, I just wanted to make this point that when we go back and look at the stone tool, we really need to ask ourselves if these guys had that particle tool, what other tools did they have? Yeah, I mean, I brought the, I've got two objects. I'll show you an object. This object, this is, this is, <clears throat> this is an X from the New Guinea Highlands. Uh, yeah, you're going to find this piece of stone. If you go to the Natural History Museum in Oxford, you will find pieces of this, this kind of stone. It's very elaborate, quite difficult to make stone. But you won't find any of the other bits. Yeah, so we sort of, it's an obvious point, but we forget. We forget to ask what kind of other technologies did they have? All right, and obviously you can do, here's another image. There's nothing on this, on this picture that's going to last that you're going to find in an archaeological dig. So obviously people have very complex behavior and you will not see it when you look back. Same here. Okay. Okay. Okay, so let's then step back. So somewhere around three and a half million years ago, uh, there were these biped great apes. So they were our ancestors. And we know that they, they walked. So in Letoli, there is this well uh, uh, dated site where you can actually see some, some people walking next to each other, pretty amazing, some people, some, some Australopithecines walking next to each other, some of our ancestors. I mean, isn't it amazing? 3.7 million year old uh, behavior fossilized 
two people walking uh, together. And then we know that this, this person looked a little bit like this, this is a, a little later, uh, was occasionally walking, that's for sure, uh, didn't have a very large skull, and used some tools. Very likely, they were these were bits of somewhat modified stone, with which you can actually smash a bone. You can take the bone marrow out. It's a pretty useful thing to do. Um, the only specially special thing about it is that they modified stone tools. So both bonobos and chimpanzees regularly use tools. So using tools is really not that special. And if you look at the brain size of, of these guys, they were really not that different from chimpanzees and bonobos. They were not different from chimpanzees and bonobos. So you can think of, of, of them at this point, so about three million, three and a half million years ago, as people who used tools, they were sort of upright chimps bonobos. And of course, then something happened because fire use came in. And, and so the next bit I want to show you is what I, I suspect about the rise of, of fire use. And fire use is something that obviously every human uh, uh, group does. And then every human culture, every human cu culture cooks. And we are the only species that is adapted to cooked food. And there's a bunch of things that are there. So, uh, I mean, the large brain, we couldn't maintain this large brain if we didn't eat cooked food. Um, our teeth would not be strong enough and big enough unless we actually had soft uh, food. Um, our rib cage would be out like this without cooked food because we would need to have much more intestines to deal with the food. So, and the, all of that happened around the turn of two million years ago. But there's a, there's a giant controversy around this because we don't really know when it happened. Richard Rangham had put, put forward the idea um, that fire use happened very early on, that the there was a shift in our evolution around two million years ago, which is very much contested. So this is one of the things that, that people at archaeological conferences will actually shout at each other. Um, because the data shows a much later, so it happens much later than when you regularly find, find in the sediments uh, uh, char, charred remains of, of a fireplace. So it's, it's controversial. It's definitely our ancestor used it by 400,000 years ago and quite possibly 2 million years ago. And then I had somehow a weird insight into this. And what I want to show you um, is, is that insight. And with that insight, I had a little bit of insight of a possible explanation of how our species appeared. In, the, in other words, how we happened. So fire is, is very useful because it scares predators away, because predators are sort of normal <laughs> beings, like most animals, they're afraid of fire. Uh, it provides additional life, light, so you can extend the day with fire, you can sit around, it, you can cook with it, yeah, so super useful. Uh, and whatever you cook, uh, you, can, you can make it, make it safer to, easier to digest. Um, and it also allows you to stay warm, so you, you it facilitates fur loss. So, so behind me, so this is a, a reindeer's fur, yeah, and clearly the reindeer skin, skin, fur. Skin, okay, a little bit of fur, but not much, yeah. So we, we, we lost most of our fur, which is very weird because if you look at chimpanzees and bonobos, they are furry, obviously. So, and, and also fire allows certain other social behaviors that we, Human, human groups tend to do around fire, like rituals and feasts, and, and we like to <coughs> read into supernatural agency into the flames and so on. Yeah? And then there's some people also use, use it uh, uh, as, as a, a source of, of, of getting high. 
I will get back to this later when I talk about saunas. So fire is, is a super useful thing to do, obviously, and these are the, the uses that I, I found. Um, the question was, how did we start using the fire? And one possibility is that there were some opportunistic interactions. So others sometimes pick out uh, food that was cooked in, in fire. Um, but there is a, an issue with this because you need to be able to control fire. And it has uh, several things. You, you need to somehow get rid of the fear of the fire and then you need to be able to contain it that it doesn't burn down your forest. So fire is actually a tricky technology, if you think about it. And again, let's think about where we were about 2 million years ago, yeah? Um, and then of course, the, the next question is, can you actually make a fire? And, and this framing and thinking about this uh, came to me with, a, with, a, with an insight. It's a very unexpected insight. It happened when, I was working with Robin Dunbar. Um, we were sitting in the same room for a few years. And, and then he turned to me and said, well, there is this paper. And, and then somebody came out, uh, uh, two authors, two scientists came out with a new uh, uh, updated version of, of, the, of Peter Wheeler's hypothesis that argued that bipedality appeared uh, because people uh, didn't want to get hot. So Peter Willer's idea was that, that, oh, isn't it interesting that if you are a savannah living ape, unlike chimps and bonobos who live in the forest, if you, have a, if you live in the savannah, your problem is going to be that you're gonna to be too hot. It's a very interesting twist because of course the mammalian trick is to stay warm. So this fur allows you to stay warm. And, and active at night. So his point was that if you are way beyond that point and suddenly you are living in the savanna and you are a daily person, you're pay, who, somebody who lives during the day, when there's a lot of la, uh, heat on you, a lot of solar radiation hitting your body and you're furry, you're going to get overheated. So you can have an example for this. Um, have you, have you ever seen kangaroos when they get too hot? So sometimes uh, the temperature is so high in Australia that it's higher than, than the body temperature for the kangaroos. And of course, our problem is that we can't, the kangaroos can't really shed heat. So, and as a mammal, if your body temperature is too high, you die. So do you know what they do? They lick it here. Yeah, so I, because this is where the veins are closed. And when you lick it, you, you start dumping heat right away. Actually, you can do it yourself as well. So if you're on a hot summer day, if you, if you really run out of every other option, option one, take a piece of ice and put it here. <laughs> option two, actually lick it yourself and that's going to draw some heat. So but almost like you're creating a sweat for yourself. And this is what the kangaroos do as, do as well. Yeah? So, so there's a, a, a heat regulation problem um, Peter Wheeler point, pointed out, and his idea was, ah, if you are standing up rather than all fours in the middle of the day, then the sun is going to hit your head and your shoulders, but much less your body, because in the middle of the day when it's hottest, it's coming from right above you. He says, all right, this is a sun umbrella. So the hair is a sun umbrella and all the rest of the body is 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 able to uh, is, is going to reduce taken much less uh, solar radiation, so much less overheating, hence the bipedality. Uh, this was not immediately endorsed by the rest of the profession, but it's a, I think it's a neat little idea, and and many people you know usually when you teach uh, human evolution you're going to uh, mention Peter Wheeler's. Uh, models. And then um, Ruxton and Wilkinson in 2011 uh, produced two papers and they sort of amended Peter Miller's model. And they said that 
you can actually, uh, uh, you're actually generating extra heat when you walk, yeah? So you know that you do that, we know that, because when we go out walking or jogging especially, we start sweating. So we sweat because our bodies are overheating and we are trying to dump heat. Yeah, so the muscle movement creates energy, we dump heat and hence we sweat. So they, they pointed out that when you're furry, then you can't do this because you can't dump heat very efficiently. So you, you can see that if you have a doggy and a doggy is running, 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 what does it do? It will lie down and go, <laughs> yeah? So lie down as in stop moving, stop creating additional uh, uh, energy and then dump heat by its tongue because it's furry and it's very difficult to, to dump heat when you are furry. If you think I'm lost here, uh, not yet. I will get to the very interesting, hopefully interesting point, but some, I will get to some point anyway. Uh, so anyway, so you, you need to dump, dump heat. And they said, if you are walking, uh, especially walking all the time, you, can, you, you can't dump heat if you're furry. Um, and so they, they had a story that, that, that uh, somehow hair loss uh, and bipedality are differently linked to our evolution. Yeah? So hair loss is the more important thing they said, and bipedality was, was the less important thing. And if, you, if you've seen any of the videos about long distance uh, hunting, exhaustion hunt, that sort of makes their point, yeah? So this would be in the, in the Kalahari, for instance, in Southern uh, Africa, where, where Kung San uh, uh, foragers would go and jog slowly, jog after a giant antelope, and then just keep on jogging and read the marks and keep on jogging and read the marks. And then at one point in the middle of the day, the giant antelope, uh, antelope, antelope exhausts, uh, collapses in, in exhaustion, this is overheats, and you can just go up and kill it. It just, it just basically died in front of you. And you can do this also a mammal because you can sweat. So as long as you can water, you can sweat through it and then you can exhaust away your, your prey. So, so, so that, was, that was that point. So Robin turned to me and said, ah, this is stupid. Uh, let's do something else because they misunderstand something. And then what they, what they said, what Robin said was they were misunderstand, misunderstanding something, it was there in their assumptions. So they assumed that these hominins lived at sea level. They assumed that they moved all the time. And then most importantly, they assumed, and this is gonna be why I'm bringing it in here. They assumed that there was no problem of being cold at night. So a few years after leaving microeconomics, I found myself modeling thermal regulation of the human body. Uh, actually, of outside of the same body. And don't engage with this slide too much. The point was that we looked at, we looked at a lot of different kind of uh, 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 bits. So you're, you have heat directly coming from the air, directly from the sunshine and reflected from other parts of the, of the environment. And then you have heat inside from the fact that you are mammals, so you're producing heat all the time and you are moving, but at the same time, you lose some heat through uh, respiration and you lose some heat through sweating. So for, and of course, to sweat, you need to be furless. Uh, and sort of I adjusted the, these, these assumptions. So I adjusted that, you know, they are going to move only 16% of the day. And, and which, is, which is going to be very important here. Uh, and then adjusted the, the daily temperature for much higher altitude. So higher altitude is going to be a lower, lower temperature. Uh, you assume that they are sort of sitting down somewhere in the middle of the day. And most importantly, you assume, we assumed that they are going to be, we, we looked at what happens, the different fur, le fur level uh, when, at night. And um, this is just to show, okay, don't engage too much. What this really shows is that different altitudes come with different mean temperatures. So sort of makes the obvious point that further higher up you are, you are going to be uh, colder. And importantly, the Australopiths uh, lived at much higher temperatures than the seashore, much higher altitude than the seashore. So it was colder. 
um, it's a little tricky again, because there are so few bones found then from the fact that the bones that were found are coming from areas where, where today are high level, it's very tricky to say that they did not live on the seashore, yeah? So, uh, yeah, but no, this is what we cook it. Anyway, and then, so I, I, I read these models and the, what these models showed is that bipedality is important and sweating is important. So what we found from these is that, that Wheeler could have been right and, and Roxton Wilkinson were right in the fact that sweating was important, but we showed that bipedality was still important. In fact, really weirdly, when you take into account that the bipedality and the ability to sweat, so hence furlessness, for a male, it just exactly hits. So a male Australopithecus and body, it just exactly hits the point where that you need to reach. So I was like, wow, it's very rare that you would have such an exact match. Although, you know, it's difficult to, 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 to get the parameters exactly right in this model. I think that these two might have played a role together. But then, um, uh, wait, and then, uh, and then, and then I said, all right, what happens at night? Because all of these models, when people run these models, they tend to focus on the problem heat during the day in the summer night when it's hot. But when you run these models, again, this is the body. Yeah? When the body is not moving, when the body is, and you're in dark, so there's no external heat coming in. If you're furless, you are really cold. And the further high up in altitude, the colder you are to the extent that if you calculate of how much extra, extra food you would need to eat to fuel your body at some of these uh, sites, then what you would end up is, what, what, with, with what you would end up is more than double the food intake, the energy intake. So you would need more than double than the daily use just to not to freeze your bum at night is obviously too much, especially that without cooking, chimps, bonobos, and, and these, probably these australopithecines were at the limit of how much they were able to eat. Because there's, you need to find the food, you need to eat the food, you need to digest the food, and it's all the raw material. So if you, if you know about the raw foodist movement, the raw foodists are usually very thin people because you can't just get enough, enough in. So and this really bothered me. And then something hit me. At this time, Richard, I really liked Richard Rangham's idea about, about cooking and the rise of fire use and cooking. That around 2.6 million years ago, look at this graph in the, in the bottom. Around 2.6 million years ago, the, the climate changed. And, and the, for some weird reason, there was suddenly this very, pronounced 41,000 year, year long cycles appeared. And a lot of climate models modeled this and showed how these cycles were just long enough that you would have, you would have the forest expand and come back, expand and come back and expand and come back. And of course you would say, well, with that, uh, the competing ape species might expand as well. But if you assume that there is an ape, a, sort of a biped ape, a mostly biped ape, ape, that is living in the forest edge, then with each expansion and withdrawal of the forest, the problem that they are facing, the thermoregulatory problem that they are facing changes. So when you expand, then suddenly you are going to be in a colder environment. So the nights are going to be much more punishing. So you need more fur. When you are, when it with forest with rose, you're going to have more time in the savanna. So you need to get rid of the fur, so you get less furry. So every round, you would need to have, you would need to drop the fur and then evolve the fur back, drop the fur, evolve the fur back. And, and of course, 
then one possibility is that at one point you just don't do this. At one point you simply start using some other method and fire would be this other, could be this other method. Okay, so this was my insight. And then I started to model fire use. Let's build a model for fire use and cooking as a technology. What would be the production function for cooking? Okay, let's do it. So I realized that there's a very interesting pattern here. Look at this graph. The, the x-axis is time, let's say time of cooking. And the y-axis is how useful the cooking is, how much value you get out of cooking. So it's a, a classical pr production function. So the, when you're a blue production function, that means that you get a lot out of cooking right away. Yeah. And if you sort of move into the red one, then you need to cook and process the fruit for quite a bit of time before it starts being valuable. So, okay. So this is how, how much your value changes, but you need to add some costs to this. What you need to add is costs. You need to maintain the fire going, you need to maintain the cooking going, and the cost that somebody might come and take it away from you. Yeah, so you've been, you've been processing the food for, long, for a while and then somebody can just take it. Yes, yeah, so if you give food for a doggy, what does a doggy do? Unless you train the doggy not to do it. What does your doggy do? <laughs> take it in right away. Actually, most of them will do this. They're hungry, food, they take it in. And they, they're going to swallow it as fast as possible and then deal with it afterwards. Why? Because once the food is inside, it's much more difficult to take it away because you need to kill them to take, take the food away. Um, unless you know, there are some birds and actually other animals that make, make, make the victims regurgitate the food. So you don't need to kill them. They regurgitate it and they eat the regurgitated food. So this is a real risk that somebody is gonna take your food away. You need to be powerful not to, to be able to protect, protect it. Yeah? So there are two kinds of costs, in, in other words. One is the continuous cost that you need to make, keep, keep the fire going, keep the cooking board going. And the other one is that somebody will, will, will take it away. So if you control for these against the three production functions, you have this really interesting pattern. So if you have the production function of the, the blue line, yeah? And now look at this bit of the, of the graph. Um, then what you have here, this is, these, are, these are the production of the value functions but corrected with the costs. The beta um, uh, is, is uh, the shape of the curve. The, the different coppers is how costly it is to maintain the fire and cool the continuous fire. And the R is the probability that somebody is gonna take it away at any moment. Yeah. So if, if nobody's gonna take it away, you are really, uh, it's a really valuable uh, production function. Then it's very clear that, that this is a production function that every living being is going to use. Yeah. So this is not gonna be the, the production function for cooking because as far as we know, our species is the only one that cooks and surely somebody would have invented cooking if it was so, so useful. So this is not the world we are in. The other version of somebody can take it away is essentially the same as the first one except you need to eat it much faster. Yeah, so you have much less, much less time for you to not to eat it, which is basically what is happening here, yeah? So you just eat it faster. The really interesting ones, when it takes time to, for, for the value to come in, yeah? So the, the orange one, yeah? You start cooking and there's not that much, not that much, and then it's really useful. And then if, you have this world, which I think is maybe the closest to the realistic version. There's something weird going on here. So if this is the cooking, cooking processes production function, then sometimes, so if it's very costly, like the bottom line here, it's very costly to cook, so costly to maintain, and quite high probability that somebody's gonna take it away at any moment, you will never cook you are going to simply gobble it all up right away. And it will never actually occur to you that you might cook. 
But the weird thing is that even in points like this, when you sometimes, it makes sense to cook after a while, there's this weird period when the value is negative. So for a while, you are investing in, investing, investing in it. And it's, it's not worth it because someone is going to take it away from you. So there's this weird process going on here. And I was thinking, right, so what is going on here? What, what kind of abilities would you need to cook? And this is such an obvious question because we cook all the time because we are human. So we don't ask ourselves about the production function of cooking, we just get down to it. But there is a production function and, and we need to, if you want to explain of how the whole thing came about, then you, we need to sort of engage with this negative bit. How come we got over this? So I looked at what would be the different, the different spaces in which of cost spaces in which you would have cooking appear. And and so, so it's very clear that if, if you have a lot of, if you have no cost, then every, every species would cook. If the costs are very high, no species would cook. But what we are interested in, the costs are just right for one species to cook that already has, has something, has fire. Because when you are adding fire making and the cost of fire making as a lump sum cost, it becomes basically you shift down these curves and it just makes no sense to cook. You just want to eat it all the time. But if you had fire, you do not push it down. You might be up in this world here because you've already done that lump sum cost of having a fire. So that would explain that if there was a species that started to use fire because the climate started to change. There was a particle cycle. And this species lived on the edge of the savanna, was able to use tools, occasionally manipulated fire. You could tell a story in which this species then started to use fire to keep warm at night. But then there's something happening, yeah? Because you, for this, you need to be able to wait. So not, it's not enough that you have fire. It's not enough that some bits of this process, you need to be in the positive, yeah? So you need to wait enough and process enough. You need to be able to wait. So if the starting point is an animal that will gobble down, the, that will have the instinct to gobble down the food, yeah? A little puppy doesn't need to learn that it needs to gobble down the food. It goes up and it gobbles it down right away. It's an inherited behavior that you need to have the ability to wait. And if you shrink a little bit, every technology that is surrounding us has the ability, the need to wait. So this would tell a story in which climate changed into a particular cycle 2.6 million years ago. This ape responded to it with fire use to keep its, its, its body warm during the night, which could have tripper, triggered cooking, but would the, via the gradual uh, evolution of temporal inhibition, so the ability to wait. And, and that might have been the point that really our story started off. So then this is a jogging animal that sweats, that has a much larger day range, so you can, you can use the, all the day, of the, or all the parts of the day, you can get much further away. Because you're cooking, it's much, the food is much, much denser, so you have larger groups, and you, you have more social time because of the fire. And on top of this, because you can suddenly invest in one technology, that general temporal inhibition that you can wait also means that you can invest in other technologies so you can build complex tools. 
and sort of that's my version of of how the whole thing whole thing happened how we we came about and this is the end of the second segment and i just finished the first segment slides <laughs> right okay here we go stop sharing ah new people Cecile, I think you are you are the one who's done for. Yes. So I'll start hello and I'll start by welcoming all the new ones, the people who came in. Well, Thomas was uh, talking, taking us through the fire making and then food cooking and then waiting period. Um, the I'll start, you know, you, you obviously, you're going to probably quite a few of you uh, have really interesting comments about it, but uh, I, I love the way you have woven all this story with using time as, as the thread, the yarn that goes through uh, the whole thing, uh, because it's definitely, it's the, uh, what I would say, the abstract, concept that comes into a man the story of the human ape is the time and that for me the way you put it is the first intellectual approach to our existence it, it is interesting that when i was putting together with these 24 little segments uh time kept coming back as as something that we maybe we don't talk enough or maybe i haven't thought about enough so time is is crucial for foresight it's going to be crucial for us to be able to deal with the collapsing biosphere because we need to be able to predict ourselves to build the kind of institutions uh but then also there's a, I, a, a, like much later like 22 hours from now, uh, the, we could talk a little bit about the difference between physical time and behavioral time. So the fact that we, we do not perceive time as a physical time, yeah? So this is just an aid, but I don't perceive that. I perceive time in rituals that, are, that have meaning, yeah? So this is why we celebrate, uh, uh, we have these weekly celebrations, yeah, the Friday evening dinner, the going to, to a place of worship, a place of community, and then going through ritual. Uh, this is why we, you know, we have birthdays. Yeah? The, the, these are ritualized time and we perceive time through this point. So, but at the same time, it is so crucial because we, we cannot possibly forecast the world without time concept. And our perceived time is such, so much more flexible and, 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 and bendy than the time of the models that we need to be able to understand. Yeah, so the lack of foresight is, is one, one, possibility, one possible reason for that. But also we, we, will, we will have time as a, as a complex institution, uh, complex technology just like now. And then when we're gonna talk about the rise of agriculture, there was another interaction between the climate's variation and time, which, which led to, I think, patriarchy. So anyway, so it's, yes, I fully agree with you that the, the time is, is something that we should be talking much more. The kind of con behavioral concept of time, the ritual concept of time, the physical concept of time, and how that is interacting. So I apologize for having jumped and uh, jumped again and just use my role as uh, to talk first. If anyone else has... I need to go, uh, I'll be back while, you, while you're chatting. I'm gonna listen. <laughs> so, um, who would like to add something about, uh, maybe the anthropologist would have their little thing to add about, uh, that story that Thomas just told us. I just had a quick observation that it's so interesting that he pointed out 
this bit about being able to wait and having patience because my whole thought is that technology makes things go faster, makes, makes us less patient so that we can drive faster, so that we can have our media immediately and has led to such a lack of patience. I just like that complete reframing of technology as, as causing us to need a skill that I don't usually associate with technology. Interesting. Tracy. Um, so my background is not cultural anthropology. I'd be interested in, in hearing um, how that concept of, of time uh, plays in in our evolution. So is that does that mark also a separation point from our earlier ancestors? And then um, another thing that came to mind from one of the last points that Thomas made in the presentation, and then Cecile, your point um, about you know being able to wait. Well, the marshmallow test came to mind. So it seemed like, well, so maybe if you're if you're able to wait, then you know what other opportunities for development does that does that open up uh, to you? That's exactly what I was just thinking about, um, Tracy, is delayed gratification. And so <laughs> delayed gratification is part of our cognitive development. It's part of our, the thing that separates us from every other great ape is the fifth level of mentalization and being able to make that delineation. And then when we talk about delayed gratification, that involves our center of emotions and all these other cognitive abilities that we've evolved, but that then loops back into the reason why we were able to do that, we think is because we were able to uh, nurture and feed this brain, which is very, um, requires a lot of calories for development and for functioning. So we, it kind of all comes full circle of why we are where we are and why we have these abilities, which is super like fascinating to me and makes me all excited. Yeah, very cool. Thanks for that explanation. So what I find really interesting uh, uh, with all of this is that Tamash places this um, at the very beginning. And as you say, I mean, coming full circle. Yes, um, so, so I think it's a really good point that <laughs> If you want to uh, make use of all the benefits of fire, you will have to have this. Uh, you, you will have to be able to pass the marshmallow test, so to say. And uh, I mean, my my one of my little ones just woke up, and um, uh, I'm watching right now how difficult this actually is, how long a process it is to be able to deal with these um, uh, delayed rewards. Uh, and, I, and I think there's also, I mean, one of the things that we know, of course, uh, about uh, inhibition is that it, it, yeah. there's a lot of variation, yeah. even in adults. So I find it very interesting to see how, uh, how obviously important this is to our evolutionary story, um, but how it's still something that we seem to uh, um, need a lot of uh, training and time and to, to come to terms with uh, in every new life. So I'm also, I'm really curious also to hear what, what so, so there's the evolutionary part, there's the developmental part, which can maybe also inform each other uh, on this topic. And uh, uh, I think what Tomash's story underlines is how, how uh, this is really one of those uh, uh, skills that gets a lot of other skills going. Uh, so the importance of understanding it is even, is even uh, greater than I, than I thought an hour ago <laughs> before hearing this take on it. From a navigation point of view, you know, we've been focused on fire, but, you know, we talk about coming full circle as you just did, but it took until whatever it was, the 18th century and the first real marine chronometer for us to be able to have a concept of time that was independent of the way that nature worked, right? Um, we have the sunrise, the sunset, the little children wake up with the sunrise, the birds start chirping. But if you think about the navigators of, of Polynesia, they could make sophisticated maps and see how the stars were moving, even if they didn't have a great concept of, you know, geospatial rotation and, and astronomy, although they certainly knew the stars. But everything was, uh, everything was uh, happening independent of man's ability to have a, a, a mechanical system for measuring it. And the marine chronometer then 
gave this freedom to man because the marine chronometer said, look, it doesn't really matter when the sun is rising or when it's setting, whether you're in London in Greenwich or whether you're around the world, this is what the time is in London. And relative to that, when the sun is rising, you can have a sense of where you are on the surface of the earth. And, and that's what this brings up for me a little bit as we think about you know, delayed gratification and how time changed. A lot of things started moving more quickly as man had this ability to measure time independent of the way that the heavens moved around themselves and man's ability to understand where he or she was relative to the stars and, and, uh, and navigation. So I, I guess I want to think about that a little bit. The Human Bee series is about understanding who we are as a species so that we can equip ourselves to take responsibility for the planet. Because if we humans are not going to do that, there's nobody else who's going to save the biosphere. If you'd like to be part of this conversation, please subscribe here now.